Joanne Garza Mayberry, Warden Mayberry. Thank you so much for being with me today. She is the game warden in Caldwell County and author of a series of children books based on her experience as a fish and wildlife conservation officer. Thank you for readjusting your schedule to be with me. I appreciate it. Sure, no problem. Happy to be here. So you made international news recently, and this is actually from the UK, which said, Texas game warden removes eight foot alligator from home that had been, people had been raising it as a pet. And that's the quote that I saw when I was like, I have got to talk to her. Can you tell us a little bit about how you came <laughs> to find the alligator? An eight foot alligator is not a small thing. Sure. No, it's not. So um, a lot of the time in our job, um, we receive calls or sometimes it's just something we fall upon in the hunting season, um, in particular for this story. And um, I had received a call in that area about somebody who was hunting without landowner consent. Um, and it was brought to me because there was a picture from a game camera from a landowner who didn't recognize the person in the picture. And, um, and so what we do as game wardens, if nobody knows who this person is, is we start knocking on doors to see if we can identify the person in the picture so we can question why they were on this property. Um, and then at that point, it's up to the landowner if they want to pursue filing charges against them for either trespassing or hunting with that landowner consent. So that's exactly what I was doing. I was knocking on doors that uh, you're hoping, or I'm hoping as the game warden that the door is going to open and it's going to be this person in the picture and, you know, case closed. But uh, most of the time they don't know who it is or they're not going to tell me who it is. Um, and so you just keep knocking on doors. And so I would that- assume people lie to you all the time, don't they? Totally uh, not me. I didn't uh- do it. <laughs> yes, they do. I mean, because nobody wants to be in trouble. And sometimes they realize, oh, I guess I wasn't supposed to be over there or I had crossed the property line. You know, just because there's not a fence doesn't necessarily mean you're still within your property or a property you had permission to be on. So um, so that's how I came across that, that one residence um, where I was just there because I was looking to see if they knew who that was in that picture. And so was that alligator in the front of the house or the back of the house? No, no, it was well obscured in the back. And so, yeah, so I basically went to that house and knocked on the door. Um, But it was a a house where um, you could tell that they used the rear entry um, for their common entry, not the front door. And so I went behind the house to access the door. And that's when I observed the alligator. So... I would just love, I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall for this conversation. Um, Excuse me, ma'am. Did you know, obviously (laughs) they know that you have an eight foot alligator in your yard. And did you know that it's illegal? Like, what did they say? It's not me. It's not my alligator. (laughs) Yeah, it was more like, um, oh, you you finally got me, you know, um, Mm. kind of situation. You know, at the time, um, the, the person was very sick, very, very sick, um, on hospice care. And so it wasn't some, it went through a long process of trying to get them or family members to pursue, um, attempting to get a permit because Texas Parks and Wildlife does offer three permits to possess an alligator. Um, but they have to be zoological, educational. Um, they have to be for the purposes of education or, um, you know, there's a farmer's permit as well, a scientific permit, um, which is mainly through colleges. So we wanted to see first, you know, can we make it legal? You know, um, even though she- I actually, consent- I read that and I wondered that I saw in, in the article that it said you had tried to get them a permit. And I wondered what the issue was of why they couldn't. And that, that makes sense now. Yeah, qualify. So a farmer's permit is somebody who's breeding. So, so there was something that counted down.
But um, but anyway, so yeah, we, we tried to make it legal. It didn't work out for her. And so then we went through the process of, all right, what do we do with it at this point? You know, because a lot of times when alligators get that big, there there's no safe option. And we're not going to um, endanger either the people trying to capture it um, or relocate it when uh, it sometimes just needs to be euthanized because of the situation that the owner put it in, not, not our situation. Um, but in this case, since it had been a pet, it was, it was more tame, never seen another alligator before. Um, it was used to her interactions with it. So what kind of interactions um, would she have with it? I mean, how close can you get to an alligator? (laughs) She would go in there and she'd feed it, you know, um and so yeah <laughs> and so um so we we tried to you know make make anything possible so so my first thought was let's take it let's offer it back to the facility that she took it from originally and um and there was some um some back and forth there and then they they gladly accepted it in the end um, and we were lucky that it was a female, even though she thought this whole time it was a male, it was a female, because it's hard to introduce uh, a male where there's alpha males. And so there's alpha males at that zoo it went back to. And so it wouldn't have had as great an opportunity or a chance um, as it did a female. So the female, um, she went back there and, and um, you know, we didn't see any issues. And, and you know, I was thinking on, on my way home after that whole incident, you know, that's the first time she's ever seen an alligator. She's never, ever, you know, been around another alligator. She's only known humans. So I can't imagine how scary that would be for that little, for that gator. I say little because the ones in there were really big. Then <laughs> she was pretty large. And there's no way that she could have gone back to the wild because she'd never herself she's never you know she's never had to go search for food or whatever and then too when they're that big we don't want to relocate them into a natural water body source because um we just don't want to endanger the public either so there's a lot of considerations that you have to take was was the lady um you mentioned hospice but i don't know if she was still on hospice were they sad to see tiwa i guess tiwa was the name were they sad to see her go yes Oh yes, absolutely. So, and, um, and she was, she had, she had recovered too. Um, her health had recovered. So yeah, she was very sad because that was her pet that she'd had for many, many years. So, but she, she was happy that it wasn't going to be euthanized, um, that it was going to a facility that's not far from her. So she could visit regularly. Um, and it seems like the, the director at the animal farm was happy to have her. Um, he told her, you can come whenever you want and visit. So um, I, I'm, I'm sure she's probably already visited at this point. <laughs> it just, you know, there's so many fun and interesting things in Texas. I really only think Florida probably has us beat for people doing nutty things, truly. Uh-huh. What do you think is the weirdest <laughs> thing that you have encountered as a game warden? Or is this it, like an alligator as a pet? Yeah, this is pretty, pretty high on the weird scale. I mean, we see a lot of weird things sometimes, but, um, but I would say this one, this one definitely garnered the most publicity. (laughs) Yeah, I bet. Um, And you are, when you go out on these um, calls, you are totally by yourself, right? Like game wardens don't, you don't have partners. You're mostly solo, right? Right. It depends. You know, some counties, especially our coastal counties, they'll have more game wardens. So they'll have five, six game wardens because they're also having to deal with the commercial aspect of fishing um, on our our bays and um, out on the coast. But in my county in particular, it is a one warden county. It's always been. So yes, I was by myself um, when I take calls and by myself in that particular situation um, when I go make contacts at residents. Um, the day we, we uh, seized the alligator, though, I was not by myself because I needed assistance for that. So, <laughs> yeah, the picture there was, I guess, the guy who had it by the head looked like he was he's he's not lacking for muscles. We'll just put it that way. <laughs> right. right. Uh, no, he, he he was OK. He was doing OK there. Yeah. But yeah. And, and they always say you, you draw the short straw when you get the tail. And that's what I had. So, <laughs> yeah. 
Um, do you ever, I know that because you are solo, there are times when you really have to be careful and be aware of the situations that you're going in. Have you had many situations where you mm-hmm. felt threatened or just been like, you know what? Not today. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's a lot of situations, you know, we train for these situations. Um, and there's situations that I've, uh, I've been in where I've just been overly cautious, overly aware. Um, and you have to be as a game warden because, you know, since I don't have a partner, my backup would be the sheriff's office or a local constable. If I'm within the city, um, it would be a city police officer. But um, most of my interactions are out in the county in very rural areas. So I always have to keep that in mind that, you know, if you if you need assistance, it's 15 minutes away. And can they find you? Because I'm not at an address. I might be out in some, you know, farmland or pasture, something that, you know, does not have an address. So there are situations where, um, you know, you have to be super, super cautious and aware. Um, and then there's situations where I, I'll assess it and think, you know what, I'm going to come back when I have somebody with me because there's game wardens in the counties surrounding me. Um, some of them are also one warden counties. So we rely on each other for stuff like that, where we think this is a chance I don't want to take by myself. So let me come back with somebody else. And maybe that's, I call them right then and they're there in 30 minutes, or maybe it's, we come back on another day. So, um, so I, I always try to keep that safety in mind for myself. Um, and for others too, you know, because when you're going into hunting camps or sometimes when you're checking people fishing, you know, hunting camps, they all have a firearm, you know, um, when they're fishing, they all have a knife. So, um, those are things we have to be aware of and, and conscientious of, but also we're not, we don't see the firearm and, and think, oh, this is an immediate threat. You know, they're using it for recreation most of the time, but it can be used for, um, illicit purposes as well. So you just have to keep all of that in mind. Of the percentage of people that you talk to, because I know that's kind of part of what you do is just going to, hey, you got your license, what you doing today? How's it going? Like it's, you, you, that's part of your job is to ask people questions. What percentage of those times are you met with hostility? Um, I would say a very small percentage of it. Uh, Maybe 15% of that time. And usually what I have found in my experience is that 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 percentage of people who are are upset immediately from the onset have something to hide because otherwise, why are are you angry with me? You know, um, game wardens are very proactive. So we're not necessarily receiving calls and then going to calls. We are going out proactively to look for people doing the right thing. Like we want you to be doing the right thing. We love when you're doing the right thing. And sometimes you're not doing the right thing and we'll, we'll have a talk or, you know, and we'll see what, where that goes from there. But, um, but a lot of times when they're angry, um, it's because of that, or a lot of times because they've had a bad experience with law enforcement and they just assume, you know, we're, we're going to do, we're going to harass them or something like that, you know, and, or they've seen something on TV and they think uh, they think badly of law enforcement. So that's my opportunity to show them, hey, you know, I'm just here to make sure everything is going well, that you're following all the rules and regulations. Um, and then I'm going to tell you to have a good day. You know, I'm not here to, to bother you. The last thing I want to do is get in your way. I want you to enjoy our resources. So, um, so it happens, but, but, uh, it's something that's more rare than common for us as game wardens. I think most of my, all, let's just say all of my interactions with game wardens have been on lakes when, you know, you get stopped by the game warden. They've always been super friendly. We mostly have been out on like Lake Palestine and Lake Tyler. Um, and it's, do you have enough life jackets and making sure right. the kids are in life jackets, which I get really bungee when we go to Mexico and there's babies on boats without life jackets. It really stresses me okay. out. Oh. But anyway, uh-huh. <laughs> um, do you, are you out on boats very much? In, in- yes. Yeah, so on every game warden, the, the county they're assigned to is the water body that they will patro- patrol the most regularly. So for me, I have the San Marcos River and the river is more of a tubing and kayak river. It's not very deep. 
um, and it's not very wide. So that those are the main purposes it's used for. It's very rarely used for any type of motorized vessel. Um, and when it is some of the, the smaller little towns in the county, they have their own ordinances. Those aren't things that we can enforce as state police, but they can enforce them, um, their own ordinances of what horsepower they allow on that particular stretch of river. Um, so um, yeah, I, I'm out there. And then what I do is I also work with my neighboring game wardens. So I neighbor to a county, Guadalupe County. Um, and um, actually before last year, they had several water bodies, but they've had some dam issues and the water has receded. But, but I'll go partner with somebody who's working close by. I work a lot on Lake Bastrop. Um, with the, the the game warden there. And so, um, because everybody likes to have, ideally we like to work with two game wardens on a boat because then one's operating the boat and one's making the contact. Um, it's a little more challenging when you are the only game warden on the boat because you're also having to manage a bunch of things. In addition to operating the boat, you're holding onto a boat, making contacts, checking fish, trying to measure if there's a citation that needs to be issued, you know, so it's much easier with two. So, so, I, and, and I just like the companionship and the, the fellowship when you go work with another game warden, since I, since we are in one warden counties. What's the, I, I read a little bit, but I didn't see the final. I know that swimming is a huge component of your testing to become a game warden, but it didn't say like what you have to do. Well, I don't know that I can answer that very well because I think it's probably changed since I became a game warden. I've been a game warden for 19 years, um, but but you do have to swim. There's a, from what I recall that is still the same, is there's a floating part where you jump in and you float for a certain amount of minutes, um, and then you have to swim um, within a timed um, uh, allotment. A certain course, and I just don't remember how many meters that is. But you do have to be a proficient swimmer um, just to qualify, because once you go into the Game Warden Academy, we do a lot of survival training in the water. Um, so those are things, you know, if, if you can't swim, there's no way you can do all these other things in the water that we're asking you to swim through and swim over um, and learn how to, to defend yourself in the water um, and and do other things, other tactical things that um, officers will need to do like we uh, are doing because we are, work on the water. So we have a high probability of falling overboard. Um, whether, you know, that's bad weather or an accident um, or just some human error. That makes sense. I think the, I never finished my lifeguard training, um, but I do remember <laughs> being very concerned about the part of the test where, because people will try in the course of saving themselves, try and drown you in the process. And it's very dangerous right. and scary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're just trying to stay above water. So that's part of our training too, is how to manage them. And then also if it just gets out of hand, how to push off of them. It's like, you know, we're trying to help you, but it, it, there's no way two of us are going to go down right now. So, but we will do everything. Um, and that's what we're trained to do is to how to manage that particular very frantic and panic situation in the water. So you you've been a game warden for 19 years so i'm sure you've seen a lot of changes when you first started how many other women game wardens were there um you know at the time i don't know but we used to have this book with all the game wardens it was called the radio handbook and so i went through there i remember going through there and i went through every um, name and I made a little stick for all the female names, I thought, because I thought, I'm going to see how many females there are. And so at the time, that was 15. But I learned later that we have male Chris's and mm. Tracy's, and, you know, and so all, all the all the names that I thought were females when I did my little count were actually male. Lacey's. So, um, so I don't really know. So I would say around 10 ish when I became a game warden. And now there are, there are, I think from what I've heard, there's uh, over 40, a little over 40. So maybe 41 ish, um, female game wardens now. Do you feel like over the course of your career and whether me too has affected it, how people, or maybe it's just, I know people interact with me differently as I'm older and my confidence levels changed, but as far as how people interact with you as a woman, 
do you think it's different than how they're interacting with maybe your male game warden co counterparts? Uh oh. Uh, do you mean now or in general? Well, do you notice a difference between when you started and now? Do you feel like there's been a shift or has it always been the same? No, I, I certainly see a shift where there's more acceptance um, and um, and more courtesy, although there's always, you know, there there's always that type of male who treats you with the same respect he treats his mom and his sisters and his wife, you know, very courteous, over the top, um, which I love that too. But um, but there's always some who think, you know, women women don't belong in law enforcement. So um, so there's always that bridge you have to to uh, pass with those people. And uh, and I know initially, you know, even even to I would say within the past year where I would get calls and I would answer hello and they would say, can I speak to the game warden? And I would say, you're speaking to the game warden. And they're like, oh, well. Um, can you put your husband on the phone? Like if I was answering the phone, yeah. So I'd say, um, well, I can, but he's not a game warden. <laughs> and so then, but that was always followed by apology. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I, you know, and I think in people's head, a uh, game warden is a male. So, you know, honestly, none of that bothers me at all. Like uh, I get called sir a lot and I know I don't look like a sir, but I just go with it. And then at some point they say, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. And I'm like, it's okay, just, let's move on. You know, let's continue the discussion. <laughs> so none of it bothers me. I find no offense to it. Um, but, and I think that it, it's very well, except especially because I've been here so long that, um, you know, especially in my immediate area, my community, my county, um, people are very positive with game wardens and very supportive. That's awesome. So the crazy stories that you have about the alligators and people falling off boats, I'm assuming those did not make it into your line of children's books that you wrote. Those seem <laughs> a little bit different. Tell us about right. the premise behind those books. So a couple of years ago, um, we do a lot of programs in schools where we go talk to kids. And this one was a particular reading program. They wanted me to go read a book um, about my career. So that's what every, all of the guests that they were coming in with books about their career. And so I said, sure, absolutely. So I jumped on Amazon and I jumped on Barnes and Noble and I just couldn't find a game warden children's book, which surprised me a lot because I thought, why isn't there a game warden children's book? You know, we have our police officer children's books. There were even forest ranger, park ranger, which we are not. Um, but there was no game warden, conservation wildlife officer, children's book. And I thought, well, hmm, that's something that I could do, you know. Um, but but I had no idea at the time how work how much work that involved. <laughs> so um, I wrote the books and the books are all about safety. So the boating book is about water safety and the hunting book talks about all the steps the little boy takes um, to to prepare himself um, for the hunt, you know, starting from um, target shooting and taking a hunter education class and um, learning how to to see where deer had been in his area, his hunting area. So um, so so all of that was that was really, you know, I wanted to put that information out there. So not only are they learning about hunting, but then the game warden comes in at the end. And so there's always a little a little there's a little conflict in the story. And then the game warden comes and they have a good talk about it. And then in the end, they've learned a lesson. So every story is like that, including the fishing story um, where she learns she wants to be independent and she wants, wants to learn how to tie her own knot and to bait her own hook. Um, and then there's a conflict that happens. And then uh, Warden Caldwell comes in and he has a good talk with them. So um, it's the books are special. They're also personal. Um, it took me a long time to decide what to name my game warden, um, whether he would be a male or a female. Um, and ultimately, I went with a male just because I thought that that would be more widely accepted. But all of the, the books have a very strong female in them. So um, in my fishing book, that's my little girl. Who, her name's Callie. And Callie's a strong-willed little girl. 
in my hunting book, the little boy goes hunting with his mom, not his dad. Um, and then in the boating book, um, the game warden Caldwell's partner is a female game warden. And um, in that book, I particularly like that I have the mom operating the boat the whole time. So usually, um, you know, in general, the mom might back the boat down, but then the dad takes over operation, but the mom operates the boat the whole time. So, um, so I wanted to make sure, you know, that I had that diversity in characters in all of the books. Did, how long did you debate between going with the male game warden and the female game warden. I had to think that a lot of your family was encouraging you to make the character like, like you, you know? Right. Yeah. Well, I, a long time actually. And I thought that I, ne I didn't want this book to be about me. You know, I wanted it to be about the, the wider message. The bigger picture was getting the education out there. And so I thought in making it a female game warden, it would be super cool. Um, but since there are no other game warden children's books out there, um, I really wanted him to, to be representative of what, what you more commonly see. Um, but I kept all of that in mind when I created my other um, characters in the books, because, you know, when you write, a, when you write, a, I guess, a, and I've never written a, just a regular adult book or whatever, um, but when you write a children's book, you are a blank slate. And once your characters are created, your illustrator says, all right, what do they look like? And so that's where you start going, okay. And they want every detail. Did you? What color skin? Did you self publish this book? Yes, I ended up self publishing the book. And then how did you find your illustrator? Uh, my illustrator I found on this um, platform called Fiverr. Oh, yes. Fiverr is all into. I love Fiverr. Do you use yes. Fiverr? <laughs> Fiverr's great. Yeah. That's, that's So I went through, and Fiverr's great can see all of their children's illustrations and what they're what they have and then you see their prices right there too so I mean there are some that are just outrageous you know I would love to use them but I can't afford that as a self-publisher um, and then there was one I, I worked with and I knew since I had the three books from the onset um, I, I wanted her and it's a female on my illustrator is a female also to be able to to um, illustrate all of those so they're all similar um at the same time and uh and just so there's that continuity of the characters and of the people in the books and um and the pictures came out really beautiful i love it too my favorite i love pictures. the illustrations they're so good uh, and it's thank you they're, they're it's perfect for kids honestly it's there's a just enough detail to make it interesting but it's not it's like a drawing it's not it's not a photo which is fun right right Yes, I agree. And I, I was really happy with the, the the way they came back. There was a lot of editing in between, you know, because my illustrator didn't know anything about hunting, fishing, or boating. So even the most finite things that you think are so clear and the picture would come back and I'd be like, that's not what was here, but that's not how it came out, you know? So there was a lot of um, Google pictures <laughs> traded back and forth. So better understand no this this is what i'm talking about you know like even in the in the boating book i wanted to make sure that the mom wore a kill switch which is a little red uh it's usually red the red coil around your wrist so if you're ever thrown from a boat the boat turns off automatically so i just wanted to make sure all of those details were incorporated in the book and of course she had no idea what a kill yeah. switch was so just a, a lot of that um how has the self-publishing how has it gone have you been happy with the sales? Is it you pushing the sales? Do you get to see, I know I saw you on Amazon. I don't know how many other places the book is available. Um, but I'm somewhat fascinated right. with this process. I've not really talked to somebody who's done it. Oh, okay. Um, so far it's been really great. You know, the initially when I first came out, all I did was make um, a public Facebook post on my own uh, page. And, and that got shared and shared and shared because I have so many common, you know, game warden friends or, or people who are in the wildlife conservation circle. Um, and so, so they were, they took off really, they did very, very well. And, um, and, and they're kind of dropping because since there is no publisher, 
I would have to go out and, and push the books. Um, and so it's just such a busy time right now for me at work and personally. So, but you know, the, the way I see it is that the books are out there now, you know, and so I can, you know, when I have more time in six months, I can push, you know, do something to push the books. But, um, but my, my concern right now is just with my work life and my family life. And that's just something additional that, that, um, eventually I'll have more time to do, but, but the, the sales have been really positive. Um, and I have received so many idea, new ideas as people are like, you know, you should, you should write a book about this, you know? And so, um, I probably have four or five other ideas that are stewing up here, plus a younger kid's book, you know? So, um, there's a lot of potential for more books, but we'll, we'll see. I want to kind of give it a, a little break right now. <laughs> you could, you could write a book about how a game warden goes out to a house and finds an alligator that has to be removed as a pet. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All that <laughs> has been presented. Yes, I'm sure. I'm sure. Well, is there anything else that, um, you want to talk about that maybe I didn't touch on? Um, not really, unless you can think of anything. How long is about 26 minutes? It looks like, mm. um, no, I, I think that it's, we've been fairly thorough. Yes. <laughs> awesome. Well, I, I appreciate you taking the time to uh, talk with me. Thank you for your patience as we dealt with Germany time versus central standard time to get yeah. it all together. Um, but you, it worked. Um, I wish you all the best. Uh, congratulations on on your books. I can't wait to see more, and definitely keep us posted on all the things that you have going. Great, thank you, Susanna. It was so nice talking thank to you. you.